Hello again guys, welcome to another Rerun review and today we're going to be travelling back to 2016 for the first in the Wizarding World spin-off series Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Directed by Harry Potter alumni David Yates and written by J.K. Rowling, the movie stars people such as Eddie Redmayne, Catherine Waterson, Dan Fogler, Alison Sudol, Colin Farrell, Ezra Miller and Roland Perlman. Taking place 70 years before the events of Harry Potter, the movie follows a character called Newt Scamander as he travels to New York to uncover new magical creatures and things go from there. So I should probably say that um, going straight into this review, growing up I was a, a big Harry Potter fan and I don't know a lot of people around my age who weren't or at least did grow up with it to some extent. It was really interesting seeing how we were now going to be getting not only a new film but a new franchise because originally this was meant to be conceived as just a three-part series and I don't know whether it was just before this film was announced or just after it but it ended up getting extended into a five-part story with The Crimes of Grindelwald as part two and The Secrets of Dumbledore as part three. At the time of recording we don't know what four and five are, we don't know if they're still happening. I'm, in, I'm intrigued to see where it is that they're going from uh, this point forward but for the time being all I'm going to be talking about is just the first movie. You know, just before I get into the review uh, one thing I do want to sort of bring up. I always thought it was a bit strange how this was the prequel series that we got because this definitely isn't what we were necessarily thinking of maybe if they were going to be making like a, a spin-off series. There have been rumours of like a Cursed Child adaptation which I, I, I'm not too sure about, it depends how they handle it. Also one of the things that I really would have loved to have seen is maybe like a Marauders movie and seeing uh, uh, James Sirius Lupin and Pettigrew growing up and seeing what they grow up to. This movie does sort of lead on into a story that I was sort of interested in seeing so it's definitely not what I would have thought of but I'm, I'm curious to see what it was that they had um, to offer for this. And right from the offer but we're basically thrown into the deep end as soon as this movie starts. Um, the movie takes place in 1926 with pretty much the entirety of the movie taking place over in New York. It's definitely an interesting direction for them to take with this because we've never really seen the Wizarding World outside of you know the UK. It was quite in intriguing to see where this new era was going to go and on top of that we've also got a different time zone as well so we're seeing not only a different setting but we're also seeing a different world in a way. We're getting a bit of a double whammy here so um, I would have liked to have seen like what the Wizarding World was like across the globe within the time of Harry Potter but it could potentially be a bit more interesting if it was different time zones because at least we could see sort of how the worlds sort of changed over the years. So the main character here is uh, Newt Scamander who's played by Eddie Redmayne. He's not exactly the traditional hero that we've really seen before in a, in a big budget movie like this but I think Newt is genuinely a good character. He is pretty much as is throughout the movie. It does, doesn't change too much. I mean, it, it does says he change, but the characterization for him is very similar throughout the whole thing. So like when, when you're sort of introduced to him, you sort of get a really good idea of who he is, and that's sort of who he is by the end of the movie. And with the film being called Fantastic Beasts, obviously there's a lot of Fantastic Beasts actually in the film as well. A new relationship with them is probably the biggest driving force for what's going on in this movie with his creatures getting out of control and him basically going after putting them down and putting them back into his case. Eddie Redmayne is genuinely really good in this role. I do like the personality and characterisation that he does bring to this character because he does make him quite relatable. He interacts quite well a lot with the, the animals as well because that, obviously most of the creatures are all CGI. I know. He definitely does sell it really well and I think Eddie Redmayne is genuinely a really good choice for this role. I think having him as the lead wouldn't have been my first choice but I think I could definitely see what it was that they were trying to do and I genuinely do like what he did with the role. And it's also nice that they didn't just necessarily copy what they did with any of the previous characters because it would have been so easy for them to have just gone okay well people like Harry so let's just make Newt exactly like Harry and then just have the franchise just basically be a continuation of that. So it is nice how he is different enough from that character to stand on his own two feet. He does carry this franchise. The only issue I can think of when it comes to his character as I've said is that pretty much what you see is what you get. You know he, he genuinely loves the animals and the creatures that he has. He's not really too keen on people so that's kind of his character arc throughout this starting to open up and befriend people but I don't really know where else they can really go from here for him so I do like what they did with him in this film but 
it's where they potentially could go with him that I'm sort of struggling with. But there is a really good supporting cast for this as well, with uh, Catherine Waterson playing Tina. I think she's really good in this role. I don't know if I've actually seen her in anything before this, but I think that she really does sell this role really well. She's a good contrast to Newt in the way that she is. Not necessarily uptight, but she is a lot stricter, but there is a nice little chemistry between the two of them, and I like how that develops over the course of the film. And similarly with uh, Queenie, played by Alison Sudol. When you first meet her, you get the impression that she's going to be a certain kind of character, but then as the movie progresses, she does start to change, you do start to see a different side of her. And again, Alison is genuinely really good in this role, and I think they all do have a really good chemistry, and you do buy that they are characters who are learning to sort of get along and start to befriend each other. But by far, the big standout for this movie, and I think most people are going to agree with me on this, is Jacob. Dan Fogler absolutely steals this movie. He's one of the most believable characters in it. He's really funny, but he's quite lovable. And I love the relationship that he has with Queenie as well. And I think that what they did with his character was really nice. And I think how they introduced him as well. It's sort of a bit of a slapsticky kind of moment. And it does feel a little bit staged, but I think he really does sell it and I really do love his character. He is by far the best part of this film. It's definitely a big departure having four leads rather than the three that they had in the Harry Potter series, but there is a really big supporting cast in this film. And like most of the actors who are in this film, I think majority of the supporting cast is genuinely really good and I do like how they are all performed. I do like what they do with their roles. So I've definitely got to mention uh, Ezra Miller as Credence in this movie. His character is probably one of the more important character puzzle pieces in this film because it's not really apparent at first just how important the character actually is to this particular story but as the film sort of goes on you start to see just how much of an impact he really has on it. I don't really want to get into the spoilers too much and there is one thing that I will want to address and I'll do that after my rating at the end so you don't need to worry if, if you don't want anything spoiled. When it comes to uh, the Creedence character I think Ezra is suited to this role I think that this is definitely one of the better performances I have seen from him but he's not the best part of this film by any means. I like him enough and I like him in this role I like the role and seeing how it sort of builds up over time and seeing his relationship with uh, Mr Graves sort of developing. And he's probably one of the other best bits of this movie I think um, Colin Farrell as Mr Graves I think he is genuinely a really good character and I do like um, Colin in this role. I'm unsure about how I feel about what they were doing with his character because I like him and I like Colin Farrell but I think where they sort of go with the character later on I'm not sold on. I think he is genuinely a really good choice for this and I think Graves is a good character but I think they could have gone a bit more with him and I think that they sort of attach him to a character for the future and it just it, it doesn't work too well for me. I don't quite see the point of it in a way because I'm not quite sure what it is that they really wanted to do for him in this film. The direction for him I think is, I'm not 100% sold on it. I like I like um, what they were trying to do with him but I didn't like the end goal. It's less predictable where his character is going to ultimately end up but I don't like where he ends up. I think the, the way that they go with him I think it's it sort of comes out of nowhere and it's you know, you, you can look back on the early parts of the movie and sort of see little things here and there, but I, it, it sort of comes out of nowhere for me and I didn't really like it too much. When it comes to Creedence, for instance, I think where they go with his character, you can kind of see. There is definitely like a very big misdirect in this movie and I think it's, it's just, it's too obvious and I think it's very clearly like, oh, this is what you're supposed to believe and then no. And it, just, it, it doesn't really work for me very well. In terms of the setting for this movie, I actually really like the change that they had for this because, you know, obviously there's, there's another movie set in New York. It's a place that I've always wanted to go so I, I really would love to see more of it, you know. Um, but in terms of this movie, I do like what they were trying to, to do, separating it enough from like, like London and things like that. It is a really nice change and I think having the Wisdom World sort of interacting, sort of being expanded a bit more, this definitely does start to feel like, start to feel a bit more like an actual world now that more places are being included. And initially I wasn't too sure on why they decided to, to stick with the time zone that they did, which is 1926. But I actually quite like that change as well because again you sort of see how the Wisdom World has changed over the years and I think getting to see maybe like, because 
a lot of the, the, the characters and the style and everything that they had in the Harry Potter movies, it does sort of call back to a lot of those older times. So it's quite strange actually seeing the people on the streets in New York actually walking around basically exactly like the Wizarding World are. So it is a really nice change and it does give you something visually different. One thing that this movie does really well, similarly to a lot of the other movies in the Harry Potter franchise, is world building. Because this time around we've got uh, J.K. Rowling actually writing the screenplay for it. So she's able to sort of delve into a bit more of the background of this universe and we're able to see a bit more than we really saw uh, for adapted from the books. And one of the biggest things that they've added from that is uh, the creatures that they have in this movie. There's so many different things that are going on in this movie. Like when you go into Newt's uh, suitcase and you see all the creatures that he's collected over the years, there's so much going on that honestly you, you just have to just stop and just stare at what's going on. The effects work that they've used to bring these creatures to like they genuinely look fantastic and there's a really good variety of them as well. There's uh, ones that are like underwater so there's like a big bubble cage where it's got like all grindelows and things like that in it. Uh, there's the Niffler who's the kind of like the, the, the poster animal in a way. Bow truckles and uh, the demi-guys who's the uh, the, the creature can turn invisible and like, apparently his, his hair is what's used to make the invisibility cloaks. Probably my favourite looking animal that I have seen that I was, I was sort of glad got a little tiny bit of screen time is the Fupa bird. I don't know, I just, I just, I just like, like birds and I think, the, I think what they did with that creature, it generally does look really good and really unique from anything else that we see in the film. But there's so much going on, especially whenever they go into uh, the, the the suitcase and especially the some of the ones that they have on screen a lot longer do have quite a big impact like the Thunderbird for instance but there's there's so much going on in the background that honestly you will be pausing it and re-watching it <laughs> but quite a new addition to the franchise is a creature called an Obscurus and it's definitely not something I was expecting and I think what they do with it is quite surprising it's, it's weirdly quite dark as well. In terms of the tone of this movie I think it is definitely one of the lighter ones they've done. It's, it's more along the lines of like Prisoner of Azkaban Goblet of Fire so it's not too dark but there are dark elements to it and the Obscurus is definitely on the darker end of the spectrum. It definitely looks unique and there is a bit of an intimidation to it. It, it definitely does look quite threatening but still quite calm at the same time so I think that it, it definitely does look very unique. When it comes to the effects overall as well not just including the creatures I think it does look really good. I think what they've done is like realise like the backgrounds and uh, the new version of the Ministry that they have Makusa that I think what they did in that set as well it is genuinely really good. There are definitely a few moments that I think could have used a bit of work here and there but it doesn't take you out of the film in any way shape or form. So I should probably talk a little bit about the story shouldn't I because I've just completely glossed over that. Uh, the story for the movie is very simple in a way with uh, Newt's suitcase bursting open and five different animals escaping and he's got to go and find them across New York and get them back into his case with the help of Jacob, Tina and Gold and Queenie. And you'd think that's really it. It is a very simple story and that's kind of all is really advertised in the marketing campaign but there is more to it and the other story that's going on is the stuff with Credence and Mr Graves. The two stories for the most part do seem really unconnected to each other. There's, there's definitely little impacts here and there but they barely have any sort of real proper impact on each other. Not until it gets to the point where eventually the two stories do converge and overlap. It does take a while to get there, so it does take a really long time for the stories to really sort of click into place. But the majority of the movie is Newt trying to find these creatures. Not until thinking back on it, there's um, one of the creatures that escapes is a billy which is like a little blue a bug with uh, twirly wings. And I'm sure he doesn't actually get it back. I think he sees out of a window at one point and that's really it, it just flies away and that's the end of that. <laughs> so he didn't actually get all of them. But let's face it, it wouldn't have been as interesting, would it? It's by far the best sequences in this movie are where they're trying to find each of the creatures, like, especially like the sequence with the Ockamy, which is like this little uh, blue lizardy bird cross thing, I don't really know how to describe it, that uh, shrinks and grows to 
whatever size a room is um, I think that, that sequence is genuinely really good and really uh, exciting definitely pushes the realm of believability at times but you know you know it, it is it is a genuinely good sequence but just just put the logical bit of your mind to the back for a little bit you know, the action is genuinely really fun in this movie you know, even like the sequence where they go to a zoo. For a movie about magical creatures, I find it so odd seeing the real things in this movie. <laughs> like you see a lion and an ostrich and seal and monkeys and all sorts, and I find that more weirder than the creatures that we're actually supposed to be looking for. <laughs> but that being said, there are two stories going on at the same time, and there is a lot of dialogue, there is a lot of exposition in this movie. It's not as bad as what future movies have done. I'll get on to those when I review those. What they were trying to do in this movie, it really it really does push the exposition just a little bit too far. I get that, you know, JK is a writer of books, so she's used to putting a lot of information and dialogue within those stories. When it comes to movies you do need to try and find a way of getting things to move along a little bit. So it does extend the runtime out just a little bit more than it really should have but it's still fun and entertaining enough that it doesn't really bother you that much within this movie. With the movie being set within the 1920s, there's a lot of different uh, costumes that they have, and I really do like the costumes that they have in this movie. It still feels very much like Harry Potter, with, like, with the way that Newt's dress was like his yellow and black Hufflepuff scarf and the blue jacket and all that. I like how it's still sort of tailored towards that time, because, as I said, it there is a lot of fashion choices within the Harry Potter franchise which are quite similar to a lot of older time periods so it definitely makes sense that people would be dressed more like that out in the open. The music for this movie was composed by James Newton Howards and he's one of those composers that pops up every now and again and I won't always say that a lot of his themes are my favourites but I do like a lot of his soundtracks and this one's definitely no different. I genuinely do like a lot of the themes and uh, jingles that he does have throughout this movie because it does harken to the John Williams theme in a way that there are definitely moments of that in there. There's a few little callbacks here and there but it is a really good, really unique theme. It definitely enhances a lot of the scale and the wonder within this movie and I really do like the music throughout. And like right at the beginning of the movie with the logos coming in the Warner Brothers and Fantastic Beasts it does have the little Harry Potter jingle right at the beginning and then it suddenly goes ah and then suddenly goes into the Fantastic Beasts theme it is really nice that they do have those callbacks in there so it does still feel like it is part of the same franchise and there are a lot of easter eggs and callbacks and references to the previous films like uh, one of the lollipops gets stolen it's the exact same one from Prisoner of Azkaban uh, the Deathly Hallows symbol there's a lot of little things like that I think they find the right sort of balance of having callbacks and not being too much you know there is a point where references come, become a little bit too much and I think this does walk that line really well and they are there is enough in there so it, it does feel like the same franchise and there's enough nostalgia in there but it doesn't take it too far. I do have to say in terms of this being a, a big franchise I feel like this I'm not sure whether this should have been a five part series. I think there are definitely issues with the film being as long as it is. I feel like this definitely feels like a very singular film. There's a few little things here and there that do sort of play into the wider story. This is very much a standalone story and I feel like it should have stayed that way. But overall I think this is a genuinely really good, really interesting uh, depiction of the Wisdom world and I think as a movie it is genuinely really good there is a good story to it There's some great characters some good music and effects i think fans are going to enjoy it and i feel like the general audience will definitely get sucked into it as well i think if you are a harry potter fan i think this is definitely something that you do need to see at least once might not necessarily be exactly your cup of tea but i think there will be things in it that you will enjoy. I think it genuinely was really good and I think out of the Fantastic Beasts movies that we've had so far this is definitely one of the best ones and I think in terms of the Harry Potter franchise I think this is in the middle somewhere maybe closer to the top than right sort of bang in the middle. I do think it is a genuinely good film and my rating for this movie is going to be an 8 out of 10. So I'm going to get into a little bit of a spoilery bit now so if you don't want to know what happens if you haven't seen the movie then this is something to click away uh, but again if you have seen the movie or you don't care then let's get into it. The big twist of the movie that I really wanted to talk about was Colin Farrell's character because as you find out towards the end of the movie that he isn't Mr Graves he is actually 
Grindelwald in disguise. That's the thing that I'm not sure on. I feel like, as Mr Graves, he is a genuinely great character, but I feel like having him suddenly be in Grindelwald, it just... I'm not too sure on it. There's definitely a few little plot holes here and there, especially like the the elder one, like where's it disappeared to, then there's his motivation and his story. I don't know if that's going to be the thing that's sort of carried on over across the movies, but I, I just didn't really think it was as good as it should have been. Also, I've got to admit that when they do reveal who it is, it is like a Scooby-Doo episode. And the real identity of Mr. Graves is... Old man Grindelwald? But why? And I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you meddling kids and your fantastic beasts. I think I might have lost it today, guys. <laughs> it, it is, it is a, a, an interesting idea for them to have done and you, you don't expect where it is going to go and it does sort of pay off the uh, references towards him throughout the movie but I do feel like Colin Farrell should have been his own character because I feel like he is a good character and I do like what they were trying to do with him but I just think that it went just a little bit too far. So that's all we've really got to say for this episode. It's a little bit shorter than usual so you know I can actually edit this a bit faster. You know, overall I do think it is a genuinely really good movie and I, will encourage, I would encourage you to, to check it out if you've never seen it. Let me know down below what you thought of it. Did you like it? Did you not? Where would you rank it in terms of the Harry Potter films? Also as well I just I just need to uh, say if you do have any suggestions for anything that you want me to cover within Rewind Reviews then let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your suggestions. I've definitely got a few ideas for a few episodes coming up that hopefully you guys will like. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to hear from you, so make sure you have your suggestions down below. Also, like usual, if you can like, if you can subscribe, if you can hit the notification button so you can actually keep up to date with things, that would be absolutely brilliant. At the time of recording, uh, we've hit double figures on the subscription, so uh, really big thankful, really, really, uh, really thankful for everyone who has subscribed, who has watched these videos. Uh, thank you for sticking around if you have stayed this long. Honestly, I, I can't do this without you, so... Thank you so much for watching and keep an eye out for more episodes on Rewind Reviews. So until then, I'll see you.